Good morning. How's everybody feeling this morning? So-so? Okay. Good. <clears throat> if you feel like so-so, you feel great. <laughs> okay. This morning, I've been given a topic to cover that is, is really challenging. And I'm a New Yorker, so I'm going to tell it like it is. Whether you are consciously aware of it or not, what you wear, how much of it you wear, and how you wear it is sending clear messages about what you think about yourself, what you think about God, and what you think about people around you. If you're having a hard time concentrating on what I'm saying, it's because you can tell you can see that my point is being made. Now, does what I wear really matter? Notice the statement from education. No education can be what? Complete. That does not teach right principles in regard to dress. And so if we were not to give you some of the information that we're going to be giving you, Maybe not quite the way I'm going to give it to you. But if, if we had no information on dress, your education would not be complete. And so this is why we have at least this installment on it. Now, before we even look at what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy have to say about modesty, look at how the issue impacts public schools. Okay, Notice this uh, the statement. Uh, in Long Beach Unified School District, one of the first mandate uniforms, schools, crime in, school crime decreased how much? 36%. Now that is huge. Any decrease would be welcome, but this is huge. Student fights dropped 51%, and sexual offenses decreased 74%. Which type of offenses? Sexual offenses, okay? According to the Pacific Standard, you see the website there. Another item. So when they changed dress to uniforms, everybody wore the same and, and so forth, uh, and, and they were, you know, tasteful outfits, all these things went down. School suspension dropped by 90% and reported bullying went down 78%. Friends, this is just changing dress. They didn't tweak anything else. They just changed dress, and whoom, all these changes took place. Okay? Now, does dress affect the workplace? That was school. Notice this statement. The way you look directly affects the way you think, feel, and act. When you dress down, you sit down. The couch potato trend. Uh, manners break down, you begin to feel down, and you're not as effective. And there's the emphasis on the studies that were made. Stephen Good states the findings of research psychologist Jeffrey L. McGee that, quote, continually relaxed dress leads to what? Relaxed manners. Relaxed manners and morals and relaxed productivity and leads to a decrease in company loyalty. Now, that's interesting. Company loyalty and increase in tardiness. That loyalty thing struck me because maybe when it comes to the dress issue and our spirituality, maybe the loyalty issue is a huge one as well. Who are we loyal to? Notice the last statement. It is a rare manager who does not realize how appearance affects credibility in the workplace. And so these are the researchers that are out there from purely a secular standpoint, telling us dress matters, that how you dress sends a message to yourself as well as to those around you. So people in the world recognize the impact of dress and modesty on attitude, morals, and productivity. Guess what? Satan is certainly aware of the power of dress or the lack of it as well. Uh, does our dress affect our spirituality? Notice this statement. Fashion 
is deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. Those are pretty strong words, wouldn't you say? Obedience to fashion is pervading our Seventh-day Adventist church. Pervading, what does that mean? That means it's affecting all of us, right? It's everywhere, affecting all of us, um, and is doing more than any other power to separate our people from God. Now, boy, what happened to the reference? I, I apologize. I guess I blipped that out. I'm sorry. We'll try to get that to you. But do you see it? Doing more than any other power. Can you think of other things that are hurting us? Well, this one, the modesty or the dress issue, is doing more than any of those to separate our people from God. So we should ask ourselves, why fashion is doing more than any other power to separate God from his people? A little while uh, later, we will hear from people who create fashion, who the fashion designers, what principles guide their creations, and what they hope to accomplish with the clothing they design. But let's, let's start at the basics. <laughs> this is you and me in our birthday suits, right? And we don't want to stay this way, certainly not when we come into public. So what do we do? We dress, right? We all dress, and I think we do it voluntarily, willingly. And, uh, but I ask you, what is the message? What is the message that you wear day by day? Well, for many of us, the message is something like this. Like me. Notice me. We all recognize that clothing is not neutral. And so we dress in a way that it will bring something to us. It'll, it'll somehow enhance our, our life or our profile or whatever the case may be. Unfortunately, the enemy wants to take you beyond this natural tendency and basically wants to use you as a billboard. Okay, he wants to use you as a billboard and the dress has to make that message and impact. And so it's just, it's going to be that way. It will change, the dress will change to make the message and Satan's message is drool. I'm cool, which really translates to I'm, I'm doing something to draw attention to myself, I'm rebellious, I'm whatever the case may be, but look at me, take note of me. So what message do you want to convey with your clothing? Because the way you dress will always send a message. Now, I'd like to give you a definition of modesty. I did a lot of research for this. My family can tell you, you know, I was preoccupied with learning some things about this. And um, based on all that I've studied, let me give you two definitions for modesty. And they're related. But here's the first one, and it may take you by surprise, okay? Core definition, modesty is freedom from conceit or vanity. Now, now does that say anything about length or, or, or color or, or fabric or anything like that? No, it's talking about what's here and here. Modesty is a freedom from conceit or vanity. I want you to think about that for a moment, really process that. What message does my mode of dress convey about what's in my heart? Am I conceited? Am I vain? Am I wanting to flaunt my stuff? Am I wanting attention? See, so modesty is an inner principle of self-forgetfulness and consideration for others. By our words, by our behavior, our dress, we display our confidence that we are valued by God and that we care about how we impact others. Immodesty, on the other hand, sends a message that we're looking for attention. We want others to acknowledge our goods and we want to exert influence over others with our sexuality. 
That's not confidence, my friends. <laughs> That's conceit and vanity. So the real question when it comes to dressing is not, how do I look? But rather, what message am I sending about my heart condition? Do you get it? Is it coming clear? <clears throat> Listen to this statement. Let believers avoid how much? Everything, anything that approaches to pride and self-esteem. Cultivate modesty. That is that God confidence. Modest. That's what modesty is. God confidence. Cultivate modesty of deportment. Humility is repeatedly and most expressively enjoined in the scriptures. Peter says, be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, the conceited, the vain, and giveth grace to the humble. The wise man declared, before honor is humility. And Jesus taught his followers that he that humbleth himself shall be what? Exalted. Okay? Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and with him and her, I should add, also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And then, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the modest, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If when we are by ourselves, we do not sense the presence of God in our lives, it may be that we're so full of ourselves that there's little room for the Holy Spirit to get in edgewise. I, that's what I get from this statement. Let me give you another definition, second definition of modesty. In other words, how does the first one translate into practical? Propriety in dress, speech, and conduct. And so modesty is not just about dress. It's really about the whole package. Dress, speech, and conduct. Now, let me very quickly share with you four biblical principles of modest dress. And you can apply it to the, to the other aspects that we just mentioned in our definition, okay? Number one, modest dressed covers our what? Can you say it? Modest dress covers our nakedness. We're going to demonstrate that in a minute. Well, we're going to talk about it. Okay. Number two. <laughs> Whew. Uh, number two, modest dress supports a clear distinction between who and who? Men and women. Is there a clear distinction? Dress should make that point. Number three, modest dress promotes and preserves wellness. We hope to nail that down. And number four, modest dress identifies God's people and impacts our witness <clears throat> and our own condition. So let's see what these are all about. Modesty covers our nakedness. From Christ Object Lessons 310, the human body, and all of us have one of those, right? Yes? Okay, the human body was the crown of God's creation. Think about that. You are the crown of God's creation. Most marvelous in design. You don't have to do anything. You already are marvelous and wonderful by God's design. Okay? Most beautiful in form and features and most charming in expression. God expressed his Total satisfaction over his creation of Adam and Eve, declaring it very good. And it goes on. In their Edenic state, man and woman wore <clears throat> only the garment of their innocence, a beautiful, soft light, the light of God. I should say the light of the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine that? Wearing the Holy Spirit. The light of God enshrouded the holy pair. This robe of light was a symbol of their what? Their spiritual garments of heavenly innocence. And so right from creation, God dressed and adorned you 
with dress. Amazing. One of my, the most beautiful kind of dress there is. Obviously, I can't reproduce it, so I'm going to, you know, to defer to these uh, little characters here. But I want you to notice what the statement goes on to say. Had they remained true to God, it would ever have continued to enshroud them. That is that garment of light. But when sin entered, they severed their connection with God, and the light that had encircled them departed. And then it is true what we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And so they tried to cover up the deficit, this huge deficit, a devastating deficit. Can you imagine having a garment of light? And then it's gone. And they tried to cover it up with the fig leaves, but God wasn't through with them. Because we read then in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, excuse me, 321, unto Adam also and to his wife Eve did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And so even though Adam and Eve lost that first, those first beautiful garments, amazing garments that they had, the Lord said, I'll take care of it. I will clothe you. And it's interesting because the Hebrew word there, coats, garments, there's different ways of translating it, makes it very, very clear that it wasn't a little patch here and a little patch there. He covered their bodies. The garment covered their bodies. And so the battle began for what would be appropriate dress, because after all, there was the enemy was still around, was he not? Notice this statement, Christians must build up the walls of modesty and virtue about them. In other words, we need to cooperate with God who clothed us. We need to cooperate so that men, women will not what? Allure men and men will not allure women from strict propriety, abstain from even the appearance of evil. Now, this, is, this statement right here is so powerful, okay? Because it really, it tells us what the issue is, what the battle is regarding clothing. Are we dressing to cover that exposed nakedness that demonstrates that we are living in sin. Not that the body, the naked body is sinful, but that the, the, the reality that we lost that first garment, that beautiful garment. Or are we interested in using our nakedness to allure, okay? To allure others to ourselves. Now, Rather than blindly seeking to be fashionable, the question we should ask ourselves when choosing clothing, when you go to the store, when you look at the catalogs, when you, when you go online, rather than asking yourself, is this fashionable? You should be asking the question, what is the purpose of my dress? Is it to allure? Is it to accentuate my form or expose my flesh in order to get attention? Or is it to bless those around me with good taste and to protect them from temptation? In other words, will I apply biblical principles in the most sensible you know, way that I can based on the environment and the temperature and, and the conditions, okay? Um, Will I apply uh, them in sensible ways, or will I follow the principles of fashion and popular styles which Satan uses to exploit my nakedness? I'm just laying it out the way it is, friends. I'm being plain and simple 
We're not playing games here. This is what it's about. Ladies, based on the statement we read, let me be specific about your attire. If the length of your skirt exposes more of your body when you sit down than when you stand up, your message is clear. You want to be alluring, okay? If your bust line suggests your nakedness or exposes your nakedness when you bend over, the message is clear. Forgive me for being blunt, okay? And I'm not the dress czar, and I don't intend to be the dress czar, okay? I'm just telling you how you impact all of your brothers. I'm just being straight and plain with you. Now, I was doing research for this presentation, and I was interested in how people in the fashion industry, because you've, you've seen Ellen White, you've seen all the statements, right? You know? And so I was interested, how do people in the fashion industry view the issue of modesty? And, and something which I knew intuitively growing up in New York City was confirmed by the research that I did. Okay? Watch this. <clears throat> we Christians are either naive or pretend to be naive about the message our dress sends to people. But law enforcement agencies and fashion designers are on the same page. They know that the fashion industry is inspired by the prostitution industry. And I'm going to demonstrate this to you, OK? At any given era in history, prostitution pushes the civic and legal boundaries of nakedness. And months or years later, fashion follows. OK, do you get my point? OK, let me just try to do this in as benign a way as possible. OK. <clears throat> Here is uh, Here's an article <clears throat> by Gloss. Gloss is a fashion magazine industry. You see there, beauty, careers, sex and dating, which of course is what it's all about, fashion, culture, and more. The article that I'm showing you recognizes that day in and day out, you see the title? According to police, most of you are what? Just like prostitutes. This is, this is what they're um, investigating, okay? The article recognizes that day in and day out, policemen are arresting prostitutes in New York City, and their dress is one of the main clues that gives them away. But it mocks, the, the, the article, obviously it's on the fashion side, right? So it mocks police for arresting a woman who is simply being fashionable. That's, that's what they say. She was wearing a form-fitting pea coat, skinny jeans, and platform shoes. What could be more normal than that? Okay. The fashion author in the, in the article states her case. She says, this could, quote, this could be my sister or my mother or me because skinny jeans and a pea coat is like the single most popular winter outfit in the country. Is she right or wrong? She's probably right. She's right. Now, the defendant, the person, the woman that was arrested, her name was Felicia McGinnis. She had been arrested on prostitute-related charges many times before. But in this case, the main evidence against her seemed to be dressing like a J. Crew model and having spoken to three people in about 20 minutes. And so the judge, Judge Menon, Menon, Judge Menon, she was a, a female. She threw out the case saying that there was not enough to justify arresting her. Now, you may wonder why in the world am I sharing this with you. Watch what happens here. We might wonder at the sense of the police force in New York City for arresting people who just look fashionable, right? Sounds over the, just superfluous. But the judge, which tried the case, said something else that was very revealing in her remarks. Quote, the characterization of the clothing as revealing because they outlined the descendant's legs 
seems more to be expected in the dress code of a 1950s high school than a criminal court pleading. Now, she was kind of tongue-in-cheek mocking the policeman's assessment, but she said something very revealing. Once upon a time, once upon a time, the outfit that this fashionable outfit this woman was wearing would have been considered indecent once upon a time. And what was the message coming from the New York City Police Department who arrested this woman three other times and would continue to arrest women based on wearing some of this fat type of fashion? You can say whatever you want about fashion, the police are saying but we know how dress works in the prostitution industry. Now, having grown up in New York City, I'm gonna kind of tell a personal story here. Having grown up in New York City, I can describe to you exactly how that works, what, what we just saw. Okay. I wonder what's happening here, okay. Uh, because I witnessed it over the years as a kid. And so let me tell you a story. When I was uh, in the early 60s, ouch, as I was a child of about seven years old, I'm walking uh, on, with my mom on the way to school, and I notice a woman on the other side of the street. She's kind of swaggering around and uh, with what seemed like a very tight shirt. I wondered to myself, you know, did it shrink in the wash? What's going on here? It just seemed unusual. And, and, and of all things, she had a tattoo on her uh, calf. So I asked mom, mom, what's up with that lady? Why is she wearing a tattoo? You know, we kids, we used to, you know, draw tattoos on and to look tough, you know, little sailor anchors. And, and then after a while, you could get these tattoo stickers, you know, you kind of lick your, you know, you'd lick yourself and then you put the tattoo on and, and it would stay there. Really cool, so I'm thinking, What's up? What's going on here? This one, she's wearing tattoo. My mother says, Sammy, that woman is a, um, she's a, uh, a street woman. Let's just say that she's not a nice woman and stop staring at her. Well, the strange thing was that months later, I noticed schoolgirls wearing tattoos. And it wasn't to look tough but it was to look cool, they said. Okay, I guess things happen. Sometime later, I noticed that these same street women, because they were all around New York City, you cannot get away from them. I started to notice that the same street women got to wearing very tight skirts as well as tight tops. And I figured they must have been poor, and, and couldn't afford to get normal clothing because the old ones shrunk. So, I mean, you know, we just, you know, that's just the way it goes. But, but the next year, I noticed at all the department stores, we didn't have malls, we had department stores, that all the mannequins, you know, all the, the plastic models, that they were all wearing shrunk clothing too. And, and so I figured it must be the new cool. By the time I was eight or nine years old, the, the street women were hiking their dresses up above their knees. And I have to admit, growing kid as I was, my buddies and I started developing a curiosity for what the rest of their legs looked like. You know, as long as part of their body was exposed, we wondered about the rest of it. I don't know if that was natural or unnatural, but... <clears throat> And as you can imagine, we didn't have to wait long because the girls at school started wearing short, tight skirts too, even though they kept yanking them down to, you know, cover themselves when they sat down. But inevitably, they gave away what color underwear they were wearing. Happened every time. Now, it should not surprise us then that the day came when the street women gave up on skirts altogether and started walking around in modified underwear. They called them hot pants, or shorts, for short. 
<clears throat> my mom wasn't happy about me staring at the street women. Um, but I wasn't worried about it because by now I knew that it wouldn't be long before everybody else would be wearing those hot pants or underwear or pants or shorts or whatever they call them. And she couldn't pick on me for staring at normal people, could she? One more thing I noticed about the street women. When the winter came to New York, I noticed that even they had to cover up some. I mean, after all, it was cold. It could get really windy. You know, those long streets in Manhattan, the wind just blows like a tunnel through those. And so, you know, you can't blame them for covering up. Um, but they put on stretchy pants so that the rest of us could still see how bulgy they were. It kind of bothered me that my mom and my aunts and my sisters eventually started dressing the same way. Because, you know, I didn't want anybody confusing them for street women. But none of the guys that I knew seemed to be worried about it. After all, they were just being fashionable. Here is a, another article by Fashionista, a fashion magazine. Um, fashion designers aim for sexual attraction to sell their goods. What people with moral sensibility would identify as the slut look. And so do the designers. In this article, Fashionista talks about, uh, they, they gave a spread with pictures and everything. And I'm not going to show you the pictures. It'd be indecent of how people have dressed over the years, eras, um, and how, again, prostitution led the charge in fashion, okay, from the, the anyway, from way, way, way uh, olden times. But uh, here then, the very last paragraph in the article is very interesting. I want you to notice what it says. Again, it's referring to slut clothing, a brief history, okay, talking about fashion. <laughs> They say, sadly, many people still consider those looks slutty rather than avant-garde or just women expressing themselves. So what is the fashion designer saying? They're saying that <clears throat> they would like you and a million other women to buy into the slut look by convincing you that you're just being unique and expressing yourself when you, you know, do the fashion thing. But as Fashionista's founding editor so eloquently put it, fashion isn't about being a slut or a saint. They know the stakes. <laughs> They're clear, okay? Notice. Rather, it's about exploring the millions of options that lie between those two borders, the border of slut, prostitute, and saint committed Christian. Don't go over here, and don't go over here. Find yourself somewhere in between those two slots. OK? So go forth. Explore, people. Show off your ankles or your, or whatever body part you like best. What is this fashion uh, industry uh, revealing? The, de the definition that I gave you at the beginning, that Fashion is about conceit and vanity. Immodesty is about deceit, about um, conceit and vanity. So this is the message fa uh, behind fashion. Dabbling between slut and saint and get attention by suggesting or showing some nakedness. If you choose to be stylish, that will be the message that you will portray. Now. Here's an American Eagle ad for the fall outfits. This is, I just got this off the internet. Ask yourself, what are the subliminal messages that this model is portraying? Look at the hair. The hair, the look on her face, suggests that she just got out of bed or is getting ready to go into bed, okay? And what does that tell men, <laughs> okay? Clothing, what do the clothing suggest? Clothing suggests that she just got dressed and didn't quite get done, 
or that she is getting ready to get undressed. Do you get the point? Listen, fashion designers spend, Madison Avenue spends millions of dollars to come up with ads like these with subtle messages. There's nothing in this picture that is not purposeful, okay? And then finally, what do the torn up jeans suggest? I mentioned to you that clothing always gives a message, right? They know it does, and they've got a message. What is their message? What are the t what's the message with the torn up jeans? This is their campaign for the fall. Destroy rules. Can it be any plainer? Destroy which rules? Rules of decency. This is not me making this stuff up. This is the fashion industry sending clear messages. Look at this one, Abercrombie, Abercrombie and Fitch. Now, based on the picture, what's the weather? Is it cold or warm? Really? Look at them. Every one of them has a jacket. The guys have sweaters and jackets on. The girl has them in the middle has a, a hoodie on. And the other girl has a, a jacket around her waist. OK, so what's the weather? It's fall. It's cooler weather. In other words, they should be wearing those jackets, right? But I want you to notice the guys are covered, but what about the girls? Ah, the girls are being exploited. The girls are being exploited. Okay. Now the question is, and so the, what is it? So now my, my question is, and you see it, right? The girl's legs, the other girl's shoulders receding on down. Okay. Is the message clear? Okay, what is the message of the advertisers here? I'm going to tell you. They tell us. They ask the question, where now? In other words, now that the clothing has set the mood, right? <laughs> where to now? Okay, and then notice what they go on to say. Here's the answer. If, if, if the question's not clear enough, here's the answer. And you can't hardly read it, but right below it, it says, looks that go from AM to PM and back to AM. So what is the message there? Where to now? Let's go somewhere where we can spend all day and all night together. They're blunt. They know exactly what they're doing. Do you know when you go looking at, you know, let's go to Route 21. Let's go to Africa. Let's go to American. Let's just go. We just want to be fashionable. We just want to be stylish. We just don't want to be, you know, out. This is what you're exposing yourself to. Through the media and at the mall, we're saturated with messages of godless fashion designers hungry for your attention and money, and we think this is all so normal that it's silly to expose it, but there is another cost to pay for bowing to the fashion industry. Let me, I don't know what my time is, but I, let me get this to you. I want you to notice the warden of one of the most famous prisons in America worked personally with and interviewed 170,000 prisoners in t over the last 12 years. And this is, I'm going to show you the statement that he made after those interviews with all those criminals. Listen to this statement very carefully. Crimes of passion are increasing alarmingly. They will continue to increase until the principal cause of their increase is what? Eliminated. And that cause is our present style of dress in America, which, to say the least, is immodest. Modest dress has a direct bearing on crime incitation. These are the secular people. This is not Ellen White. This is not the pastor. This, these are people that are dealing with this day in, day out. Let me skip because I know my time is going. Number two, modest dress distinguishes men from women. Notice Deuteronomy 22.5. Cannot be any clearer. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a 
man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. First Testimonies 457, there is an increasing tendency to have women in their dress near as the other sex as possible and to fashion their dress very much like that of men, but God pronounces it what? An abomination. And this is not because God is squeamish, but because God cares about what unisex dressing does to your psyche and to your society. Notice this next statement. God designed that there should be plain distinctions between the dress of men and women and has considered the matter of sufficient importance to give explicit directions in regard to it for the same dress worn by both sexes would cause what? What would it cause? Confusion and increase of crime. Now, I want you to look at something here. For the same dress would cause confusion and increase of crime. Do these young people look pretty normal to you? Well, they do for our day and age. They do for our day and age. But you notice they're all dressed the same? Okay, and what did she say? The same dress worn by both sexes would cause what? Confusion and increase of crime. And I'm not gonna get into all the details of all the bestiality and all the craziness that is going on out there as a result of this prophetic insight being fulfilled through un because of unisex dress, okay? <clears throat> Number three, uh, modest dress promotes and preserves wellness. And they, uh, there are all supremely sensible things that we would happily do if we were not for the captivating power of fashion, which causes us to violate any or all of these. Let me list them very quickly. See, modest uh, dress is modest. It avoids pride, display, whatever excites admiration. We've already covered that. It should be economical. It should avoid costly garments and costly accessories. Money should be used wisely and to take care of better things than pride. Durable, they should be simple quality of becoming colors suited for service. And all of this comes out of the Ministry of Healing, chapter 22 on dress. You can go to it yourself and do the research and be blessed by the points. Protects, the dress, modest dress should protect, provide temperature control and proper protection. Remember the picture of the models? It's winter, you know, it's fall, it's winter, and the girls are and right? Okay, why? <laughs> because Satan is wanting to use their nakedness to, to attract attention. Sensibility would mean covering those legs, being warm, and so forth, okay? Uh, next, attitude. Avoid weary, weariness that results from the rule of fashion. How much time do you spend getting dressed? How much time do you spend looking for clothing to buy? She calls it weariness, weariness, okay? Efficient, avoid practices that squander time, waste energies, hygiene. Clothing should be clean, sensible, serviceable. Circulation, clothing should be worn in such a way that it protects the limbs, loose fitting garments at the waist and so forth and so on, instead of that shrunken clothing that you know, the women of the street were wearing, right? Okay, uh, study, body needs. Uh, you should study your body needs, the climate, the health conditions, age, activity. All of those will inform how you should dress modestly. Number four, modest dress identifies God's people. Very quickly, notice what it says in First Peter. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal what? Priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. That is, if you are a Christian, if you're dressing like a Christian, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of this darkness, and we describe that darkness, into his marvelous light. Child guidance. The dress and its arrangement upon the person is generally found to be the what? The index of the man or the woman. We judge of a person's character by the style of dress worn. 
A modest, godly woman will dress modestly. A refined taste, a cultivated mind will be revealed in the choice of simple, appropriate attire. The one who is simple and unpretending in his or her dress and manners show that she, he understands that a true woman, true man is characterized by what? By moral worth. And then this last statement. Many dress like the world to have a what? An influence, right? Hey, I just want to fit in so that I can witness to my friends. Have you heard that one? Have you used it? OK, but, they, but here they make a sad and fatal mistake. If they would have a true and saving influence, let them do what? Let them live out their profession, show their faith by their righteous works, and make the distinction between a uh, great, not small, great between the Christian and the world. I saw that the words, the dress, the actions should tell for God. Then a holy influence will be shed upon all, and all will take knowledge of them that they have been with Jesus. Unbelievers will see, see with their eyes, that the truth we profess has a holy influence and that faith in Christ's coming affects the character of the man or the woman. When we go on mission trips, and, and academy students, you know, it may not be your choice of dress. When you go home, you may throw it off and you may put on something else or take off or do whatever. But I want to tell you, when you go on mission trips and dress like we do here at OH, people notice. People notice. And they say, we can tell that these students are godly students. We want to be like them because they notice in your dress and in your deportment that there's something different, something desirable, something that they want. And so my question as you dress is, do you care not just about yourself, but do you care about others? There are several questions I had here. I'm, I'm just going to skip these. Um, I'm going to skip this too, skip that. Here's the last statement here. The very dress will be a recommendation of the truth to unbelievers. It will be a sermon in itself. Just how you dress is a sermon. And so you may not get up at the pulpit. You may not study theology. You may not know how to give a Bible study. But just how you dress can give a sermon. Do you remember these guys? <clears throat> This side of heaven, I want to leave you with this question. This side of heaven, what message will your dress and deportment give to those around you? My prayer, my prayer is that the message will be that you are heaven bound. Let's pray. Lord, I realize that um, I've said some things that are challenging. And Father, the last thing I want to do is be considered a, a dress czar around here. I don't think any of us want that. But we wanted to tell the truth about what drives the fashion industry. And we wanted to tell the truth about the stakes that are involved in the way that we dress, oh God. Help us to help us to do to be courageous, to not just stick with the status quo, but to be courageous and make courageous decisions about how we dress, how we act, how we speak, so that instead of digging others deeper into the morass of nakedness and immodesty and conceit and vanity that the enemy has plunged us into, especially in our Western culture, instead of that, that we will, by our dress, lift others up, encourage them, bless them, show the way 
the way to heaven where one day you'll restore us with those garments of light. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.